up next on Hudson Church. It's only through Jesus. When we put our minds on Jesus, when we put on that helmet of salvation and our mind is on what he has done for us, we continue to renew our mind when we learn what his will for us is, what his promises are, what he's created us to be, is how we begin to renew our mind in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Um, so today we're going to talk about something that I think probably a lot of us don't like to do, especially the dads, but it needs to be brought to light. And so this word was deposited, and I kind of want to go through a little bit of how I received this word. Um, but this is something that does take a little bit of effort on our part, and we're going to talk about cleaning out the basement, our spiritual basement, cleaning out our spiritual basement. And when I think when we think about basement, we think about, you know, a place underneath the house, right? A place to store things, maybe a, a place to hang out, a place we hold things. Or for some people, it's kind of a dark, scary, dungeonous place. You know, this part of the country, most houses have a basement, whether you're in an apartment building, a condo. And if your house doesn't have a basement, maybe you have a storage unit or a plastic container somewhere, a keepsake box, something that we store the stuff. So we're going to take a look at what those things mean to us and through the word of God do an inventory on what we're going to be keeping and what we need to release to the Lord. Amen? Amen. Me personally, I, I always like to watch those shows where people have a lot of stuff. And, you know, at the end of the show, you have that instant gratification. They clean it all out, and it looks really nice, right? Or those homes that are really run down, and at the end of the show, you know, in a blink of an eye, the house is made brand new. It went from, like, shabby to grand, right? But what happens when we only fix the outside? Or we only look at the appearance? Or we merely organize what's inside, right? So guess what? These areas fill up with stuff again. And when we don't maintain the outside, guess what? It starts to get run down again. And sometimes that maintenance <laughs> costs more than the actual renovation. Because the issue isn't about getting ourselves organized, just a little nip and tuck, right? It isn't just about the appearance. It's about the nitty gritty or putting your commitment to action. Saying, God, I love you, and loving our neighbor. It's about doing what we were created to do, not just do what our flesh desires. To say, Lord, I'm here to praise you and to worship you. It's learning about what God wants for our lives, knowing that there's Christ inside of us, and that we should be who he created us to be, to strive to please him because of what he's already done for us. He's given us Jesus, amen? amen? That we can please him, that we can learn what pleases him, and only can we learn that through the word of God. Otherwise, we're left to govern our own moral law. We're left to govern what is good and evil, right and wrong, what is flesh, what is spiritual. And when we're doing that, we're not pleasing God, we're pleasing ourselves. So ultimately, the battleground is here in the mind. When we battle internally instead of spiritually, we are fighting from a place of defeat. But when we fight with our spirit man, we surrender to God knowing that the fighting in the flesh is futile. We learn to fight from a place of victory through Jesus Christ because he is the victorious one in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to look at what Paul writes to the believers. If we can get ready, Nicole, because I know you need to switch monitors. What Paul writes to the believers in Rome about the battlefield of the mind, and I encourage you, 
to read Romans. This is going to be in Romans 7. We're going to start with Romans 7. We're going to end with Romans 8. And he talks about, you know, living under the law. So if we can start, and this is going to be Romans 7, 15, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Nicole. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And I think that this, wow, this portion of the Bible is really powerful. It's relatable. We can understand it. And this is in the TPT. He says, I am a mystery to myself for what I want to do, what is right, but end up doing what my moral instincts condemn. Verse 16. And if my behavior is not in line with my desire, my conscience still confirms the excellence of the law. Verse 17. And now I realize that it is no longer my true self doing it, but the unwelcome intruder of sin in my humanity. Verse 18. For I know that nothing good lives within the flesh of my fallen humanity. The longings to do what is right are within me, but willpower is not enough to accomplish it. Do we know that willpower is not enough to overcome sin? Only through the Holy Spirit can we overcome. Only through Jesus. Only through Jesus. Only through Jesus. Amen. Let's jump down to verse 24. It says, what an agonizing situation I am in. So who has the power to rescue this miserable man from the unwelcome intruder of sin and death? Amen. Verse 25. I give all my thanks to God for his mighty power has finally provided a way out through our Lord Jesus, the anointed one. Let's read Hudson Church. So if left to myself, the flesh is aligned with the law of sin. But now my renewed mind is fixed on the submitted to God's, God's righteous principles. I apologize. That was a little cut off. Amen. So our renewed mind is only through Jesus. When we put our mind on Jesus, when we put on that helmet of salvation and our mind is on what he has done for us, we continue to renew our mind. When we learn what his will for us is, what his promises are, what he's created us to be, is how we begin to renew our mind in Jesus' name. Amen? When we try to fix things externally or superficially, only one of one thing happens. Your state will be the same as it was before, or according to the word of God, it will be worse than you were before. Let's look at Luke 11 to confirm this, please. Thank you. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places, seeking rest, and finding none, he says, I will return to my house from which I came. Why is he returning to that house? Verse 25. And when he comes, he finds it swept and in order. Verse 26. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. We put things in order. We get things organized. But we don't fill that space with the Holy Spirit. We say, I'm living for God. But we don't know anything about the word. We're not in relationship with Jesus Christ. We've never accepted him into our life. We don't put him first. We don't separate that time. This is what happens. Your state is going to be worse than before. When I got this word from the Lord, it woke me up out of my sleep. What is in your basement? Loud and clear. I tried to go back to sleep and it woke me up again. What is in your basement? So I meditated on that. Later that day, I went down to my basement. And I was like, what's in my basement? Let's see what's going on. And I looked around and I didn't see anything that I didn't know was already there. So I wondered, is it a warning? Is something going on? Is there mold? Is there gas? Is there a leak? Is there water? I mean, I'm in there with like a flashlight. My husband's at work. He doesn't know what's going on. I'm running around the basement. And again, looking in corners, pipes, testing the alarm. I didn't find anything. But that word kept coming. What's in your basement? What's in your basement? So a third time I went down and I just sat on the stairs and I looked around and I put a different filter on. 
And I looked around at the stuff, and this is what I saw, and this is a lot of what we have in our basements. It was just old stuff. Old stuff that we just hold on to for no reason, just holding on to it. The seasonal stuff. The stuff we put on once in a while. The stuff we drag out once in a while. The stuff when we remember it's down there, right? The stuff that we say, I'll use someday, but never do. Whether that's an old pair of jeans, a jacket that you're hoping will come back into style, this thing that you bought on TV that you're like, one day I'm going to use it. But we know in the spirit realm, the stuff that we're never going to use, the stuff that we fill ourselves up with, the stuff that we listen to, the, the music, the TV, the stories, the books, the news, all of these things that, you know, it's good to know, but we're never really going to use it. Stuff that I have never let go, baggage, memories, reminders, sentimental things, other people's stuff. Mm, stuff that is not mine, that I have allowed myself to hold on to. And there's one more thing that's not in my notes that the Holy Spirit told me and showed me this morning. Religion. We keep religion in our spiritual basements. Those traditions, those things that we hold on to, things that we feel were passed down. I don't know why the church doesn't do this. I grew up doing this. Things that we need to clean out. In my basement, there are useful things too, like tools and workout equipment. There's a pantry, there's storage of things we use pretty regularly, paper goods, plastic, all that things that you know would normally find in a basement. And you're probably thinking that my basement's pretty big, and it is not. It is very cramped. And at this time, it is not very usable. And it's going to take some work so that it becomes functional and becomes a resource to my life instead of something that I dread, something that I go downstairs, shut the light off, and run out when I don't need to be down there because I don't want to deal with it. And I think that a lot of us are that way sometimes, probably more than others. We don't want to deal with it, so we let it pile up. We let it fester and we let it get so out of hand that getting back to that area just seems impossible. But let me tell you about my God. <laughs> because nothing, 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 nothing is impossible with my God. <laughs> nothing. And on top of that, we can, we can, we can, absolutely can do all things through Christ who strengthens us, all things, amen? amen? You know, we see each other here, we meet each other, we greet each other, but the reality is that we don't really know what's in each other's spiritual basement, right? No one knows what we put away in a box, like in a plastic container. We shut it, and we shove it in a corner, and we think that that tape that we wrap around it is going to last. Those trinkets of memories that we want to keep, secrets that we think no one will find out about, our God knows all these things. He knows our hearts. He knows our thoughts. He knows our motives. He knows our intentions. For some, it's pain. It's regret. It's what ifs. It's trauma. It's unforgiveness. For some, it's envy. It's fear. Things we don't want to face. The things we continue to tuck away. But our God, he knows all things. He sees all things. He is in all places. Amen. Hallelujah. Second Chronicles 16.9 says that the eyes of the Lord roam to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. Amen. Amen. We're going to look at a couple of hallelujah. Give the Lord a clap offering. We're going to look at a few Proverbs and Psalms. Proverbs 15, please. It says the eyes of the Lord are in every place keeping watch on the evil and the good. Amen? Psalms. Keep going, Nicole, please. Thank you. It says, depart from evil. Ooh, this is not the scripture. Psalms 34, 14. Okay, keep going. Proverbs 5, 21. Thank you. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you. It says, for the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all his paths. He is watching all of our paths. He is watching where we walk. He is watching our intentions. Amen. And the last one, Psalms 33, 18. Thank you very much, Nicole. Praise God. It says, behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him and on those who hope in his mercy. Amen. He is always watching, always knowing always there. There is not a place that he is not, even in our spiritual basements. And what happens when we start the process of cleaning out the basement in our lives? Your Words Matter, a new series by Pastor Renee Abreu, now available on the Hudson Church app and streaming platforms. You know, why don't we start it? Why do we put it off? Sometimes we start it and then we don't finish, right? Why don't we just keep going? And for some, we think it's a burden. We think of shame. We think of guilt. We think, I don't want to deal with the emotion, the memories. I don't want to face the truth about certain things. For some, it's about holding on to old stuff, family secrets, mistake, abuse, addiction, past lifestyles that we don't want anyone to know about. But a surprise, we all have that. We all have that. And hiding it and pushing it down and not letting it go and not releasing it, not, not submitting those things to the Lord, doesn't make it go away. Being embarrassed or thinking that someone's going to look at you differently, guess what? We all have a past. We have all been there. Not any one of us was born a believer. We were born to be believers. Amen? Amen? Amen. So as we continue to build a life on top of these things, as Christians, we know that if we build a house on a foundation on anything other than the cornerstone of Jesus Christ, the fall will be very, very great. Psalms 27, 127, please. It says, unless the Lord builds a house, they labor in vain who built it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. Amen? Amen. Because when the storm comes, the collapse will be very great. Matthew 7. Thank you, Nicole. It says, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. Let's keep going, please. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. Amen? Verse 26. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man. Do we have any foolish men here today? Hallelujah, no. Who built his house on the sand. Let's keep going. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and, the, and, the, and, the great, and great was its fall. Hallelujah. Family, it is time to sift through the stuff, the stuff that takes up the space. Let go of the remorse, the regret, the revenge. I don't know why all those things came out in ours. But then he gave me three more, three disappointment, despair, and indifference. It is time to let those things go. We need to look at the things that we put on once in a while, the things we put on for show, those decorations, those bright and shiny things, colorful things, and put on the crown of God's righteousness. Amen. 2 Timothy, I don't know if I gave it to you, but can we look at 2 Timothy 4, 8? Thank you, and the New King James is fine. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And it talks about the crown 
of righteousness. We have a crown of righteousness. Do we know that, Hudson Church? Hallelujah. It says, finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me, but only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Right. Amen? Amen. We need to stop taking on other people's stuff, feeling responsible for other people's problems, responsible for their happiness. We need to just, just stop. We need to just stop because we take on a lot of other people's problems. We take on their debt. We take on their issues. And I want to read through a Proverbs that really, really, oh my gosh, I just, I read this in so many different versions, Proverbs 6. And I want us to read this together. I want us to read this together because these Proverbs talk about taking on someone else's loan. But you know what? When we take on someone else's problems, it's the same as being in debt. Because you say, I'm going to be there through the end, through whatever's happening. You can rely on me. And then we realize it's not even our battle to fight. We should have just led them to fight in, in the spirit realm, to give this to the Lord, to submit this to Jesus. It says, let's read. My son, if you co-sign a loan for an acquaintance and guarantee his debt, you will be sorry that you ever did it. Verse 2. You will be trapped by your own promise and legally bound by the agreement. So listen carefully to my advice. Verse 3. Quickly get out of it if, you're, if you possibly can. Swallow your pride. Get over your embarrassment and go tell your friend you want your name off that contract. Verse 4. Don't put it off and don't rest until you get it done. Verse 5. Rescue yourself from the future pain and be free from it once and for all. You'll be so relieved that you did. Amen. Cleaning out our spiritual basement takes effort. But in the end, you will be so relieved that you did. We put ourselves in debt. Surety, the word uh, calls it also security, but not only with money, right? With our word, with a promise or a guarantee. And we must do everything to be released from that agreement. We are to love our neighbor. We are to go the extra mile, but we cannot do it for them. We aren't to walk their walk for them. We aren't to run their race for them. When we take on other people's stuff, it keeps us occupied, it keeps us distracted, it keeps us ineffective, and it keeps us idle. When we tie ourselves up with the same people, with the same areas, that boyfriend, that girlfriend, people we date, the people we spend time with, that same troubled family member, that coworker who always needs help, the things that we do, those are our choices. And sometimes we do those same things over and over and over until it just becomes something that we do and we store it away. And when that person comes into our life, we pull it out and we do the same thing. That person that always needs help, you already know they're going to rely on you. You're just going to say yes and you're going to, you know, cut away the things that you have committed yourself to do to help this person. Instead of saying, have you prayed on this? What does the word of God say? Have you received counsel? Are you a part of a church? Have you received Jesus? Do you know him? Oh, you're a believer? So what does the word say about healing, about debt, about relationships, about your kids, about your marriage, about your parents? Amen. Counsel them in the word. Don't keep doing the same things, putting up the money, putting up the time, spending three hours on the phone. Don't keep doing the same things. You're storing that stuff in your spiritual basement, and it's time to clean it out and let it go in Jesus' name. Amen. And we need help. Do we need help sometimes? Holy Spirit, help me. Holy Spirit, help me. Sometimes we need to schedule time. Do you set apart time to talk to God? Do you set apart time for prayer, to read the word? Do you hold yourself to that commitment? Do you make that appointment with God? I know I always don't. So I can't imagine that everyone here does. But what a great resource, time. 
Sometimes the best thing we can do is just meditate. Read those targeted scriptures about the situation and the things that you want to move out of your life. Meditate, bringing all things to the Lord. Amen? Amen. Philippians 4 says to meditate on what is true, what is noble, what is just, what is pure, what is lovely, and what is of a good report. Things of virtue and things that are praiseworthy. Some things in that basement need to go. We need to pull it out like a weed. Boom. Meditate on what is pure and lovely. Meditate on Jesus. Reliance on the Holy Spirit is what really makes any of this possible. He, the Holy Spirit, is the driving force behind all of God's plans. He is the movement in our walk with God. He is the power behind anything good that comes from God. He is the one who helps with the battle of the mind. He is the one who clears a path through the basement for us to walk through. We can sort and release the stuff, taking up space where the Holy Spirit wants to dwell, family. Way deep inside, not on the surface, way deep inside. Not just to make us clean and tidy, but to fill us until we overflow. Overflow, family. He wants us to overflow with his love, with his mercy, with his grace. He is the helper that we need when we're in a deep, dark place. When it is scary, when it is damp, when some basements are deep and wide, he is there with us. God is so good. He showed me what things look like when they're in order, when we can use that space as a resource to our lives, when we can do all of the things that he's called us to do. When we clean out that spiritual basement, it becomes a resource, and the Lord wants to fill that space up. Amen? So we can stand on that firm foundation, so we can show others his mercy and his grace, praise God. We can magnify his name, we can glorify his name, we can do his will, we can rely on those promises, we can preach his word, we can minister to others, we can go out and seek and save the lost. All of these things that start happening when the engine is cleared out, right, and it's filled with the Holy Spirit, a limitless source of energy, the Holy Spirit, amen? We can use this newfound space to hang out with him. Amen. Ensure that the walls are shored up with his righteous right arm. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus, our cornerstone. I want to close with this. If we can, Nicole, can we look at Romans 8? We're going to close with these scriptures. Amen. Thank you. It says, The mature children of God are those who are moved by the impulses of the Holy Spirit. 15, please. And you did not receive the Holy Spirit of religious duty, leading you back into the fear of never being good enough. But you have received the spirit of full acceptance, Holy Hudson Church. Enfolding you into the family of God, you will never feel orphaned, for as he rises up with us, our spirits join him in saying the words of tender affection, Beloved Father. Verse 16, let's read Hudson Church. For the Holy Spirit makes God's fatherhood real to us as he whispers into your innermost being, You are God's beloved child. Amen? Amen. (laughs) Hallelujah. You know, for believers, it's never too late to start this process. And for non-believers, it is never too late to receive Jesus. The one thing that's true for everyone is that time is running short. So right now, you have that opportunity You have that opportunity to enter into relationship with Jesus, to get to know him.